I was chatting with Pastor Denny before he left for vacation, and he said, you know, a really good mother lets her kids lick the mixer blades when she's making cookies. I said, yeah, I have great memories of that. He said, yeah, but a really great mother will turn the mixer off first. And then he left. So, well, our passage this morning is taken from 2 Timothy. If you have your Bibles with you, um, I invite you to open to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then um, chapter 3, 12 through 17. I will be reading from the NIV. From Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and I am persuaded now lives in you. In chapter 3, verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that you, a man of God, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Father, thank you that your scripture is God-breathed. Thank you that it's useful for training us in our lives. Thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit at this service this morning, ministering to each one of us exactly where we are. May the words of my mouth be acceptable in your sight. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, one day there were four ministers that hanging out, talking, as so often happens, a conversation soon drifted to shop talk. One minister said, well, I prefer the King James scripture. I think that um, it's, it's eloquent use of the English language just makes scripture sing. Second minister said that no Bible could match the New American Standard for its faithfulness, the original Greek and Hebrew text. Well, said the third, yeah, that might be, but I really prefer the NIV. It's contemporary language and it's readability thoughtful period of silence. The fourth minister said, I like my mother's translation the best. These people were stunned. They looked at him with surprise and said, we didn't know your mother translated the Bible. Yep, she sure did, he replied. She translated it into her daily life. And it was through her translation that I came to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, I thought it would be fitting since this is Mother's Day that we remember two mothers who are my favorite, Lois, who was the grandmother of Timothy, and Eunice, who was Timothy's mother. In particular, I would like to honor the heritage given Timothy because a mother and a grandmother not only loved him, but loved him enough to give them their most precious possession, the gift of faith by sowing good seed. Now, before I continue, I want to acknowledge that I am well aware of all the fathers and grandfathers in this congregation who play very active, solid roles in the lives of their family. However, it's Mother's Day, so they get top billing. When Paul mentions Timothy as a co-sender in six of his letters, he also spoke highly of Timothy in his letter to the Philippians. So confident was Paul of Timothy's faith that in his first letter to him, he called him my true son in the faith. 
Timothy became the inheritor of Paul's mission. In Paul's first letter, written near the end of his life, he speaks with, um, without any reserve at all, calling Timothy, my beloved child. Timothy truly was a part of Paul's lineage, wealth, and crown. And I don't know how much you have studied the Apostle Paul, but I can't believe for a minute he would have turned his ministry over to just anybody, that Timothy would have had to prove that he was rooted and grounded. Well, we're not told much about Timothy's dad. We don't know if he was a non-believer. We don't know if he was a non-Jew. What we do know is that most of Timothy's learning came from his mother. Eunice was Jewish. Apparently her father was not very orthodox. He violated one of the biggest commands of the law in arranging a match for his daughter by arranging it with the Greek slash Gentile. We learn this in Acts chapter 16. Later when Timothy was born, verse 3 tells us that he was not circumcised. So it seems that neither Eunice's father or husband observed Judaism, but Eunice did. In 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul praised Eunice and Lois for their genuine faith, which they shared with Timothy. Paul's appeal to her faith probably referred to her faith as a believer in Christ, which also reflects Paul's view that such faith is the genuine expression of the Jewish heritage, that faith in Christ is the true continuity with the religion of the Old Testament. And even though it appears that she did not have the support of her husband, Eunice chose to convey that faith to her son. And more than anyone else, she equipped him for a lifetime of useful service for God. Eunice may have had no formal religious education, we are not told that much, and maybe she didn't even have a lot of encouragement from her family, but she had the dynamic power of a loving God. Now, this story is not new, because we know that many families in today's culture have an absent father spiritually. Eunice should be an encouragement to every single mother faced with the daunting task of nurturing the spiritual life of her children, especially if she can't count on the help of a strong spiritual father. There are many families today who are in this particular situation. The mother and grandmother are solid Christ followers. But the father is either not interested in matters of faith Perhaps he's antagonistic to anything religious. Maybe he was raised in the church, but the demands of life consumed his time. He no longer made attending church with his family or serving the Lord a priority. You know, in our economy today, it's very possible that dad had no choice because a job keeps him on the road or out of town more days than he's home. It's just the nature of our economy. So mom takes the responsibility of providing guidance for children within that community of faith. She depends on her church family, and that's us, the body of Christ, to help nurture her children in the Lord. She makes an effort to make them involved in church, make them involved in the youth groups. So Lois's story is not a new story. You know what? We serve a God who is a God of grace. And he worked through Eunice and Lois and others to nurture Timothy's heart. Today, he works through moms, grandmothers, and his church body to nurture our children. Paul found in Timothy a descendant, someone who would carry on that spiritual family name someone so identical in faith that the force of the work for Christ would have always complement that of his mentor, teacher, and surrogate father. Early Christians had access to the Old Testament, and they freely used it, but they didn't have the New Testament or any other Christian books. They couldn't hop down in their golf cart to Barnes & Noble and pick up two or three commentaries. 
They had to depend on what was passed out. Stories of their teaching about Christ were memorized and passed on from person to person. Remember in Deuteronomy when Moses was talking to the children in chapter 6? He said to them, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. That, that doesn't say, that's not speaking of bring them to church and drop them off every week on Sunday or have a Bible study once in a while. This is a lifestyle. You're talking about the scriptures when you're hanging out, when you're in the park, when you're eating lunch, when you're, when you're going to visit relatives or you're just walking along the way. You're talking about this. You're applying it. You're using everyday examples to show how scripture fits. So that is exactly what Eunice and Lois did with Timothy. Paul was aware of it. Because in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, I know your grandmother, and her faith is authentic. It's the same faith that I have observed in your mother, and after watching you all this time, I'm convinced this is your faith also. Lois and Eunice showed Timothy by word and by example what it means to live an authentic faith. It's a faith that has no hypocrisy. It's totally absent. It's genuine. It's sincere. It's the real deal. <coughs> what higher accolade or greater tribute could a child give any mother on this Mother's Day than to say, Mom, you gave me authentic faith. Those of us who are parents quickly learn that it's not possible to convey the depth of joy or pain that we experience through our children's lives. And as they grow up, in the same way children learn, it's not possible to adequately express how much they love their parents. Now, there is a block of time there when um, mom and dad are really dumber than dirt. But then they grow up, and all of a sudden, wow, how'd you guys get so smart all of a sudden? They realize that they finally come to the point where they understand how much we love them. But this ongoing dialogue of joy and love and pain and, and hope and dreams is especially true the relationship between a mother and her offspring. It's something very special that God has given us. It's the mothers who transmit hope and faith from generation to generation. I was looking up some quotes by people uh, in history, and I came across one by George Washington, who said, my mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All that I am, I owe to her. I attribute all of my success in life, the moral, the intellectual, and the physical education I received from her. In a similar fashion, Abraham Lincoln said, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. No man is poor who has a godly mother. I thought, hmm, I wonder what some modern day people have said. So I found one by Buddy Hackett. Said his mother's menu consisted of two choices. You either take it or you leave it. I thought we needed some reality in there. My kids never called me an angel mother, but they are very loving. God works through grace in our world today. He works through each one of us who are willing members of the body of Christ to teach children. They might not be our children, but they're the youth of North Lake Presbyterian Church. They're the youth that you have contact with out there in the everyday life. Timothy's values and his behavior were molded by his grandmother and his mother. In Hebrews 4.12, Scripture reminds us that the Word of God is a lot. It is active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. How many times have you been reading a familiar passage and all of a sudden it will hit you? Your heart will be touched. It will be cut. And you realize, oops, I need to go back, take a few steps back. 
That's what scripture does. These are the tools for navigating life. <coughs> Timothy was given a sincere faith transmitted to him by his mother and his grandmother. <coughs> In order for us to grow up spiritually, we have to grow deeper. We have to get on the milk of the word and get into the meat of it. When Paul wrote his first letter to the Corinthian church in chapter 3, he addressed that. You know, you guys are still feeding on the milk. You need some meat. And this is what we have to provide our children. So how did Eunice prepare Timothy to exercise self-control? Have the kind of self-confidence that allows one to put the use of the power of the Spirit to love, to be loved. How did they do that? Well, Paul reminds him that they did it by making known to him the Holy Scriptures from the time of his infancy. He grew up with it. Scripture is God's powerful tool to influence children's lives for good. Through parents, grandparents, mentors, us, the church community, teach and live the truth of God's Word. Because of the faithfulness of his mother, Timothy was like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season. Leaf doesn't wither. Ever they do prospers. Psalm 1 is just a beautiful psalm that reminds us how important it is to have deep roots spiritually. He learned from birth that God was the vine and that Timothy was the branch. John 15, 5, Jesus says, If you remain in me, and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. When we are rooted and grounded in God's word, we will bear fruit in our life. God will transform us from the inside. The teaching of scripture and the lives of our children and grandchildren is very, very powerful. Paul talks about, uh, in chapter 2, he reminds Timothy that false teachers had been deceiving themselves. They were deceiving others. They had abandoned the truth. They were coming up with these meaningless speculations and these foolish desires. But in chapter 3, verse 14, Paul says to Timothy, but in contrast, to listening to the false teachers, you continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know from those that you've learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. What Timothy had learned from his mother, his grandmother, from Paul and others, has deep roots he can trust. What our youth here learn from their mothers, their grandparents, from this church community, from others, has deep roots. They can trust them. Paul goes on to remind him why teaching the scripture is important in verse 16. Because all of it is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, for reproving, correcting, for training in righteousness or right living. Why? Why do we want to be rebuked and trained and, and be reproved, be corrected, so that the servant of God can be thoroughly equipped for every good work? We are here to serve God and to have we have a job to do that he's given us through our particular gifts. That's why we want to read scripture and apply it. So what can we glean from this portion of scripture? We know we want our children to survive out there in that jungle of drugs and bullying and moral decay and selfish living. And no matter how old our children get to be, 40, 50, 60, we're still the moms and dads. And we still want them to be able to cope. Our world has a value system that increasingly mocks the teaching of scripture. Many mothers today are carrying that load. The, 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 Many of you grandparents here are actively involved. Some of you long distance, but you're actively involved in teaching and training your grandchildren. You're making a difference. I know there's days that you think you're not. And again, regardless how old your children are, 
when they ask for help or ask for advice. Sometimes you feel like it's falling on deaf ears. But remember, what, it, what you say has, has been sanctioned by the Holy Spirit. And when it goes through his hands and is received, you are making a difference. You may not see it immediately, but you are making a difference. We need to join together with the parents and grandparents of our children to teach them the sacred writings of God's Word. We must use it also to teach, reprove, correct, and train on how to maintain a right relationship with God. It's not passed on by guesswork, not passed on by a lick and a prayer. Training in righteousness takes place when mothers, grandparents, the body of believers consistently and conscientiously teach and apply scriptural knowledge. It takes place when young people continually hear that the most important thing in life is to keep a right relationship with God and with others. We are so blessed here at North Lake because we have a fabulous youth director, Little Blessings director, Logos director, in addition to all of you, many of you, who are dedicated volunteers willing to work with our youth. And we have a super, super group of youth at this church. As a church family, we can support their efforts by modeling that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, and continue to support their activities. Some of you are not actively involved one-on-one -on -one with the children, but you are wonderful at supporting their mission projects and the different trips that they take. Pause for a moment and think about today's scripture. Eunice lived prior to our time, and I doubt that she had any idea how God was going to use Timothy. I think there are many, there were many days that she was tired, she was exhausted, she was worn out, and on top of it, Timothy was being a real jerk. And she just wanted to throw up her hands. I think she probably just got on her sandals and walked down to Starbucks and just numbed out with a latte. But her teaching was making a difference. Look at our youth. Many of them you have known from infancy. If you attended, if you were a lady and you attended the last PW retreat we had, we were so blessed to have our youth give that program. And I was just blown away by their personal testimonies. And the one thing each one of them mentioned, they pointed out people and said, I've known you since I was a little baby. You've known them from their infancy. And you really have impacted their lives. Moms, I just want to thank you for your faithfulness and your godly example to your children and for bringing them up in the nurturing and instruction of the Lord. And I just wish you a happy Mother's Day. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for those in this congregation that are so actively involved with our youth, with their own children, with their own grandchildren. There are days that they're discouraged and they just wonder if they're making a difference. In some way, just wrap them in your arms and help them to understand that you are working through them, whether we see it or not. You are present and you are making a difference. We don't know how you're eventually going to use these children, even if our children are grown up. But we know that when we're faithful and we teach them the scriptures, that opens the door for you to work. Help these parents and grandparents just feel a very special appreciation. Help them understand how much you admire and appreciate their faithfulness and just bless them in a very special way. I just ask this and thank you for it in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.